There we go. Okay. So, um, Kabbalah Decoded, today we are going to talk about a certain teaching of the Sefer Yetzirah. And the Sefer Yetzirah is a, um, is a work that was originally compiled by Abraham, Aram Avinu, and was written down by one of the latest sages named Rabbi Akiva sometime in the first, second century around there. <clears throat> But it was passed on, it was passed down from the time of Abraham. It is a book which I've spoken about on many occasions before. It deals with many of the secrets of creation, bringing uh, things into being, creation, how it was created, and so on and so forth. But what I want to focus on today is one particular Mishnah, one particular section of the one teaching of the Sefer Yetzirah, and I'm going to put it up on the screen. Uh, is that visible to everybody? Um, yes, you can see it, yeah. Uh, you were just looking at the Kabbalah decoded sign, or weren't looking at me? <laughs> yep. Okay, so everybody can see it. Uh, good. Okay, so <clears throat> uh, the Hebrew reads as follows. Uh, this is again Sefer Yitzira, Perik Bet, Mishnah Dalet. It says like this, Chav bet ot yot yesod kvum ot begalgal berala sha'arim Chaza ha-galgal panim va'achor simon ladawar e'en betova lama lemi oineg ve'en berara lama temin nega Now let me just explain what this is. So the Seif Yitzhira says as follows, there are 22 foundational letters. These are the <coughs> letters of the Hebrew alphabet, <coughs> excuse me, which are called foundational. They're called foundational because um, they are the forms of energy through which the creation was brought about. That's why they call the foundation. Everything is, is, is based on, is founded on the combinations of these 22 letters, the 22 letters of the alphabet. Now, um, just to explain this um, briefly, the concept of letters is, I think, much better understood in a modern context today than it was ever understood um, in previous earlier generations. In other words, we have a very, very good analogy for the whole concept of letters. <clears throat> As everybody knows, um, the DNA um, that that is the basis of all life the, the DNA molecule that is the basis of all life is a combination um, of what's called a double helix. Uh, there are two um, chains of, um, uh, they're probably chemi two, of chemical compounds, two chains of chemical compounds, which uh, are in a certain uh, format, and these chains of compounds um, are in fact called, according to the, the, the various combinations between the two chains, are, are, are symbol, symbolized by letters. Um, I hope I'm getting that right. Again, I'm not a scientist, but um, that's what I remember. <clears throat> In any event, um, basically the same concept is found in Kabbalah. And in fact, I would venture to say that the discovery of the DNA molecule and the naming of it, etc., etc., is based, in fact, although Francis Crick and his and his, um, and his um, fellow academics did not, I'm not saying they learned Kabbalah, but it's based on the facts of the basis of life. The basis of life is, uh, as we said, the Hebrew letters of the alphabet, and they go in, they work in certain chains, and these chains chains of, uh, of combined letters, and these chains are in fact the basis of all kinds of life, and what makes different creatures different is because of the different combinations. So this is what the Sefer Yetziri is talking about. It's talking about the foundational letters of the alphabet, which come into various combinations. And this is what it goes on to say. There are 22 foundational letters set in a circle with 231 gates. Now, the way this is explained is that there's a circle, an outer circle with letters, and then there's an inner circle with letters. 
a circle inside the circle. The outer circle is um, stable. It doesn't move. And the inner circle does move. Now, on the, on the circle, you will find, like, all the letters of the alphabet, all the letters, letters of the alphabet um, written on the outer circle and the inner circle. So the way that we would um, make a combination of two letters, the Sefer Tira says before this, that two letters makes a gate, makes a gateway so to speak, it makes a pathway, it makes a connection, it makes a channel of energy or a channel of information. And that the DNA is really, the DNA model is a model about information. It's about information in the cell. In any event, these two foundational letters uh, are set in a circle with uh, 231 gates. Now, when we say in a, in a, in a circle, this is just the way we, we conceive of it. It's not necessarily that there is a circle there, but it's just that when we see it circular-wise, it's much easier to, uh, to, to see how it works. So if you imagine that the letters are aligned one with the other, first there's an aleph, and below it, in, in the upper circle, there's an aleph. In the lower circle, there would be a bet. And then if you revolve the lower circle, go from go bet the second letter of the alphabet, it will go to gimel. So it'll be aleph bet, aleph gimel, aleph dalet, etc., etc., if the inner circle revolves. So the circle revolves forwards and backwards. The circle, the inner circle can revolve one way, can revolve the other way. Now, what you see outlined in yellow over here, uh, the order of the letters does not matter, but we know by different words, by changing the order, yes, we're going to get there. Um, the, there's no difference in the Hebrew. There's no difference in the Hebrew uh, that is in the Torah and modern day Hebrew. No, there's no difference. It's the same. It's the same Hebrew. Yes, there are differences of expression, but it's the same letters and many of the same words in modern Hebrew. Of course, modern Hebrew is more a sort of, uh, you know, there were a lot of words added in based on. Um, words that were used in, in, in speaking in different languages and so on and so forth, but it's still based on the ancient Hebrew. <clears throat> it's not like Latin and modern Italian, uh, not like that at all. <clears throat> so, um, now, this is the basic formation is that there are two letters, it's a two-letter combination, but of course one can understand that it can be more than a two-letter combination as well. And we're going to give an example of that three of a three-letter combination over here. This is what the Sefer Yetzirah goes on to explain. A sign of this is that there is nothing in the side of good higher than delight, which is called Oneg in Hebrew, and that's the word over here, Oneg, as you can see it here in the Hebrew. I just, uh, out, I just um, highlighted it. And nothing in the side of evil lower than plague, nega, right? So nega is this word over here. Let's put that in a different color. We'll put it in a purple color, okay? That's oneg and nega. Okay, can everyone see that? Now, if, you, if, you, uh, if anyone reads Hebrew, you will see that these are exactly the identical letters. There's aleph, uh, sorry, ayin, nun, gimel, and again, nun, gimel, ayin. Same letters, different, different combination, different, um, uh, different series. Same letters, but in a different permutation. That's what I was looking for, permutation. Okay. Here now I'm going to explain a teaching that came from the... Uh, Hasidic Rebbe, known as the Tzemach Tzedek, a great, great Hasidic rabbi, who um, explains to us some of this concept. This concept is going to explain to us this idea of there's nothing higher than delight and nothing lower than plague, nega, and how the two things fit together. So this is what he said. The letters Ayin, Nun, and Gimel for the word oneg, that's the first word again in the um, 
in the three letter combination that we're going to look at. So the letters I, Nun, and Gimel, say, says the Tzamach Tzedek, stand for the words Eden, Nahar, and Gan. Now let me just uh, explain that in English. That would be Eden, Nahar is a river, and Gan is a garden. Um, what about Aramaic? Someone is asking. Is it possible that the well, there's Hebrew, Aramaic, but Rabbi knows them. Um, um, um. Yeah, the Aramaic is actually a different language. It's very similar to Hebrew, but it's not. It's not the same language at all. It's a translation into uh, into Aramaic. Uh, is the class going yet? Yes, the class is going. If you can't see it, maybe you should uh, log out and log in again. I don't know why you can't see it. You should be able to. Um, can everyone hear? Everyone see? Can everyone see the screen? Yeah, okay, yeah, good. Okay, I don't know what's, uh, someone's not getting it over here. I think they need to uh, log out and log in again. All right, very good. So, again, uh, we have Eden, river, and garden. Nahar is a river, Gan is garden. Now, when we say Gan, we're referring to the Garden of Eden primarily. It's called Gan Eden, the Garden of Eden. Gan, this word here, and Eden, that word there, the Garden of Eden. So the word Oneg then, which means delight, is a notaricon, or um, uh, it, it uses the initial letters, it's called a notaricon, of the words Eden, Nahar, which means river, and garden. Now these correspond to three svirot, to three divine emanations. Aden corresponds to chokhmah. River, Nahar, corresponds to Bina. And finally, Gan corresponds to Malchut. So Gan Aden, the Garden of Eden, is when chokhmah illuminates Malchut. The Garden of Eden is when Chokhmah illuminates the sphere of Malchut. Now, let me explain this a little bit more deeply. Um, I can explain the following. <clears throat> when we're talking about the light, there's nothing higher than the light. What this means is that Chokhmah via Bina illuminates Malchut. Now, how does this work? Chokhmah, as we know, is the first of the imminent, first of the imminent, uh, imminent svirot. First of the svirot that is called an or pnimi, a light within a vessel. Bina is the expansion of Chokhmah to the extent, extent that Chokhmah and Bina are called train rain the lomit parshin laalmi. Like in the Zohar, refers to Chokhmah and Bina as the two. Beloved friends who never part. Where you have Chokhmah, there you have Bina. We have Bina, there you have Chokhmah. And when both of them together through Chokhmah, uh, Chokhmah through Bina illuminates Malchut, then you have a system. Uh, you have a you have a situation called Oneg, the light. Now, why should that be? Why should this be a concept of the light? Why is this a positive com com uh, combination? A positive permutation, so that we're talking about the delight of the soul, because chokhmah, which is really wisdom, is the starting point. When wisdom is the starting point and is then uh, put into intellectual concepts, which is what bina is talking about. Bina is the expansion of chokhmah, and when wisdom is expressed in ideas, in analysis, in, um, in, in philosophy, in philosophical ideas of the Torah, and that is then invested in malchut, speech and action, that is a positive combination, that's a, that's a combination which is called the delight, of the, soul, the, the delight of the soul. But it has to start off with wisdom. Now, what is wisdom? So chokhmah in Kabbalah, is often referred to as um, is often referred to in Kabbalah in the in the Tikkunei Zohar, 
Tikkunai Zohar is one of the books of the Zohar, Chochma is referred to as um, Koach. Oops, it's in Hebrew. It shouldn't be. It's referred to as Koach. Koach Ma. Let me just get that up on the page there. Koach Ma. Okay, Chochma is referred to as Koach Ma. Or in Hebrew, that would be uh, Koach, oops, Koach Ma. Right, Koach Ma. What, what does that mean? What does Koach Ma mean? Koach Ma is a way of explaining how something is in a state of self-nullification. Chochmah always represents wisdom is not necessarily, wisdom is not the same thing as understanding. A person can understand something without being wise. A person can have tremendous knowledge without being wise. A person can have tremendous understanding and, and the ability to recall it and so on and so forth without being wise. Wisdom is knowledge and understanding in its deepest roots, in its possibility of self-nullification in that my understanding, my wisdom should only be consonant with or in sync with God's wisdom. That's what Koach Ma is all about. The word Koach means potential or power and ma means literally what? The power of what? The power of self-nullification. The power to nullify my understanding, my knowledge, my um, <clears throat> wisdom to the supernal divine wisdom. So when things therefore start off with ko with chokhmah, with koach ma, and only then go to understanding, when wisdom then flows into understanding, and that, both of them illuminate Malchut, Malchut being the Sphira, which corresponds to the physical powers that a person has, speech and action, thought also to a certain extent, but speech and action primarily is associated with Malchut. So then, the... Um, Then Malchut, our speech and action, is a form of delight. It's delight to our soul. It's also delight to other people. It's Oneg. However, the Sefer Yitzhira goes on to say the next, um, the next concept. Oh, man, what happened here? Okay, there we go. Okay, the next concept. Can you see the next one? Everyone can see that? Yes, that can refer, yes, Gloria. It can refer to the nullification of the student in front of the teacher in order to understand in a parallel sense. Yes, absolutely. But it starts off with the what, what one seeks, the beginning, the, 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 the first point, the first movement is a motivation to not understand, but a motivation to become wise. Understanding is an intellectual pursuit to a certain extent. It doesn't have the depth of wisdom. People can have a lot of understanding and still do the wrong thing. Wisdom allows you to do only the right thing. Okay, so now, <clears throat> uh, let's go on to the next one. We said before that there's nothing higher than Oneg, and there's nothing lower than Nega. Nega means a plague. Here we can see that the letters are switched around, they're reversed. And the reversal of the letters leads us to understand why the Sefer Yatira is telling us that there's nothing lower than um, there's nothing lower than plague. Now when we're talking about a plague, a plague is, um, is generally, uh, many of the plagues came, came um, were manifested in the way it's, it's spoken about in the Torah, were manifest, manifested as skin diseases like leprosy and things like that, or a type of leprosy. 
<clears throat> so these were these were signs on the outside that not all was well on the inside. That things were there was a certain illness on the inside, so to speak. So now let's look at the word nega. Ne nega would also would then spell nahar, gan and Aden, river, garden and Eden. In other words, what the person is seeking, if we're going from right to left over here, what the person is seeking is first seeking to understand. He's seeking the river, he's seeking to understand. Understanding is again bina, but without the wisdom. Seeking to understand, and the purpose of his seeking, seeking to understand is so that he can experience the garden. In other words, that he can, he can express his understanding in speech and in action. But that is not, one might think that's a positive quality, but it's not. It's not a positive quality because understanding without wisdom is an expression of self. It's not an expression of something beyond oneself. A person would be hoping, therefore, to be able to achieve wisdom this way, but it's not possible to achieve wisdom. It's only possible to achieve nega. If wisdom comes at the end, that is not the beginning point, then um, yes, and that is exactly, that is uh, philosophy. Uh, that is the point of philosophy. Yes, philosophy um, is, follows, this, um, follows this path. And when we say philosophy, we mean um, primarily secular philosophy, philosophy of... Um, uh, which, which which does not lead to spiritual wisdom. It's the philosophy today has become very, to a large extent, um, the ability to argue your way out of any situation. <laughs> it's not it's not wisdom literature anymore. Philosophy used to be wisdom literature once upon a time, but. Um, uh, there's a lot of negative repercussions that can happen when a person wants only understanding and 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 and, and uh, wishes to express uh, him or her or herself in in words and in action, and only then hopefully to come to the idea of uh, of of Eden to come to the concept of wisdom. A lot of negative uh, consequences. Now there's a story that um, that is told that that sort of illustrates this. This is the story that's told about actually in one of the commentaries on this particular Mishnah. There's a commentary from someone named Rabbi Sadia Gaon. Rabbi Sadia Gaon was one of these about the 1000s, 10, 10 1100s, and he wrote a commentary on the Sefer Yetzirah, and he tells the story there of one of his um, contemporaries who was teaching his students the he was teaching his students the Sefi Yetzira. So the students got together and um, you know they they you know yeah, it's like like with anything practice makes perfect. So they were studying uh, after they'd uh, received the lesson from their teacher and they wanted to put into practice and see what would happen, you know, when they used the powers of the Sefer Yitzira, this power here of um, combining the 22 letters of the alphabet to form the various uh, 231 gates. So what they did was they decided they were going to make a goylem. Uh, what's a goylem? A goylem is like... Uh, the word, the literal word in English is a homunculus, I think it's called. In other words, make a humanoid out of um, clay and breathe into it the breath of life by using the letters of the alphabet. The only problem is, or the only disadvantage is it can make a humanoid. The humanoid can't speak. It doesn't have the power of speech. He's only motivated, um, motivated, moved, and uh, enlivened by the power of the letters within him. And uh, so they set about doing this. Um, uh, they, they, they made a human form of clay, this humanoid sort of a form. 
And uh, then they walked around it uh, according to the recipe that they'd been given by their teacher, and they followed the instructions and um, uh, started to make this this creature. Started to put life into it. However, they made a mistake. Um, they made a mistake, and so they knew they had to reverse. They had to go back a few steps. So they walk backwards, they're walking backwards, as they, instead of walking around this figure and making the, uh, the forward combinations, they walk backwards and made the backwards combinations. But what happened was <laughs> that they themselves then sort of started to revert back to earth. So they got caught up to their waists in, uh, in, 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 the, in the mud, in the clay, and they were shrieking, they couldn't get out of it, and the teacher heard and he came to see what was going on. And uh, they told him what happened. So I said, okay, so just say the combinations in the right order and you'll be able to get out of the mud. So they did that. And they went in the right order to go and got out of the mud. Now, so in other words, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, don't try this at home. <laughs> um, it might not be the most um, effective way of going about your day. So, in any event, these, uh, these, these things can be used, obviously can be used for very good things. It's, it's spoken about in the time of the Maharal of Prague. The Maharal also made a golem, and uh, he used it to uh, protect the people of, of Prague, the, uh, the community in Prague, and uh, eventually he um, removed the life from this creature, um, there's various uh, stories about how he did it, um, but in any event, he removed the cre he removed the life from the creature, and uh, it was buried then in the attic of the Maharal Synagogue in Prague. And the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe actually went up there and he saw it, and he. Um, uh, his, and his father told him afterwards that uh, he shouldn't have done that, but nevertheless, um, he managed to survive the, uh, and there's many stories about that particular, um, about that particular golem, the story from the time of the Nazi occupation of Prague, that they had heard about this uh, story about the golem of Prague, and they wanted to prove it wasn't true. They sent a soldier up there, Actually, an officer up there to uh, poke around, and he poked his bayonet into the um, into what was there, um, and uh, died on the spot. Um, and there's there's a lot of other stories, but we the, the, the point is not to get into them into them now, but to explain uh, this idea of of uh, oneg and nega. So Rene asked the question, is Nega the same as Klipot? And in fact, it is. Yeah, Nega is exactly the concept of Klipot, because what is a Klipa? Klipa, Klipa is really uh, translated as the word shells. But Klipa means that which puts a barrier between a person and God. That's what a Klipa is. It puts a barrier between the person and God. That's why it's called a shell. And that barrier can often be um, an intellectual barrier. We put our minds in front of our wisdom. We put our an analytical capabilities in front of wisdom. You see, today, in universities and colleges, nobody is taught wisdom. They're taught analysis. They're taught Bina ideas. They're taught how to use Bina but they're not taught how to use Chochmah. They're not ta taught how to access Chochmah, how to access wisdom. And that is, it causes, it brings about a tremendous separation. That's Klippa. That's unholiness. Whereas Oneg, as uh, Rene points out here, is the idea of cleaving to the Creator. That's what wisdom is all about. Wisdom is the ability to set one's own self, one's own understanding aside and receive it as it is, the truth from above. That's Chochmah. 
Chokma seeks the truth, Bina seeks understanding. Chokma seeks the inner core, the inner uh, um, life force, the ma, the godliness within. Bina is merely the vessel for understanding. Chokma is the light, Bina is the vessel. If we seek out the light and the vessels follow that, that's fine. But if it's the other way around, then it could be that we'll never come to the light. That's the uh, that's the idea. Um, life in the darkness causes great suffering, right? Correct. So that is the idea, therefore, of uh, of of nega. So that's why the Sefer Yetzira, when it talks about when it talks about this, it says that there's nothing higher than onik than the delight of the soul in God. And there's nothing lower than nega, which is the separation of the soul from God. When a person comes separated from God, that's when illness happens. That's when these diseases, this plague, takes place. Now, uh, in in the Torah, in, in biblical, um, in the Bible, when it talks about plague, it talks about how a plague is how plague is a uh, spiritual impurity as well as a physical ailment but the main ailment is spiritual impurity and therefore a person who is being cured from his nega has to go through a process of purification one of the pro one one of the uh, one of the um, methods of purification one of the uh, requirements for purification is that it has to be separated from everybody for a period of time he has to become separated in order to understand what this idea of separation is so he has to be in isolation uh for a period of time before he can and then he has to go to uh he has to dip in a what's called a mikveh he has to dip in uh, purifying waters he or she has to dip themselves in purifying waters in the mikvah, and that brings about the understanding of that we're all part of a much larger picture. The purification procedure, first of all, keeps the person separate, then he has to go into water to purify himself or herself. They go underneath the waters of the uh, the mikvah, the uh, ritual uh, immersion pool, called the mikvah, and with the understanding that sort of the, 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 the waters below merge with the waters up above. Water being a symbol of kindness and, um, and, and lack of um, waters, waters, water is colorless. So that colorlessness is teaching the person to have a certain color and colorlessness about his relationship. In other words, it shouldn't be the relationship with, between him and God should not be marred, so to speak, by um, his coloring it in the way that he wants to see it. It has to be the way it is. Pure water, the way water was meant to be. It's without, without, dyes in it without coloration in it and so on so, uh, and so on and so forth so to speak so therefore uh the purification from nega is possible but the primary purification is that the things have to be turned around to the right order first there has to be aden and then river and then garden first chokma wisdom and then understanding and then acting it out in deed and in speech and that's the purification which is required and the purification which works. So the question is, uh, of course, as Terry asks over here, how does one go beyond Bina to Chochma? The main concept of Chochma, again, is Bitul, self-nullification. Opening oneself out to, uh, opening oneself up to the wisdom which pours in from above. The wisdom is not something that we possess. It's something that we're given. 
It's not something that we possess from ourselves. In other words, we don't manuf- wisdom is not manufactured. Understanding is manufactured. Chokhmah is comes in as a flash of insights. Chokhmah is also called in Kabbalah. It's called Baraka Mavrik. Baraka Mavrik means the lightning flash of understanding. It's an intuitive, it's intuitive uh, wisdom, right? Intuitive wisdom. Intuition is something which is not analytical. We don't make it. And intuition is grasping things the way they are. That's what intuition is, grasping things the way they are or, or the way they will be. So that's the concept of Chochmah. Now, how do we um, work on this idea of Chochmah? That itself is a whole, um, a whole independent lesson, and maybe we can talk about that possibly even next week. But this whole idea of Chochmah, to be able to get to, to Chochmah, we have to, we have to acquire it from outside. It has to come from outside of ourselves. It has to be wisdom is something acquired, um, as, as I said before, as a flash of insight, but we can be taught how to open ourselves up to the idea of wisdom. And that's what um, really we ought to do, we must do in order to be able to become um, wise people. So how we go about that, perhaps um, we will talk about that next week, about the, the concept of Chochmah and how to acquire, how to acquire Chochmah, how to acquire wisdom. That's next week's topic, folks. Okay, any questions on this one? So avoid a bit all, yes. All right, so it doesn't seem that there's any more questions. Um, I'll wait another minute. Chochmah. Chochmah, the door to Chochmah, yes. Chochmah is the door to Chochmah, indeed.